Hey everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to continue our conversation on period three. So last time we talked about the French and Indian War um, and kind of the outcomes of that conflict and then got into a little bit of the immediate issue that came after that, uh, the Stamp Act and then the Stamp Act crisis. And so today we're going to move forward in the aftermath of the Stamp Act and talk about the road to revolution and how we would get from this period where uh, even at the end of the Stamp Act, still most Americans are still loyal to the British crown to by the end of this video to a point where they are uh, not only actively calling for independence, but actively fighting a war to have independence from the British Empire, the strongest country in the world at that time. Um, and so let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, the road to revolution. Now, really when we're talking about the, the American Revolution, I need to be clear on this. If you're looking for the one thing that leads to the American Revolution, you're not going to find it. Um, the French and Indian War gets us on this road to revolution. The Stamp Act is part of us getting on that road. The things that we're about to talk about are going to get us closer and closer, but it's not any one thing. It is a cumulative effect. It's really, and really, if you were to try to make it a, in a nutshell, it's a series of British actions and then colonial reactions. Okay, so the British are generally ones taking an action, um, and then it's the colonists who are seeing these things and reacting to them that generally will cause another British action and then another colonial reaction and so on and so forth until, guess what, a revolutionary war breaks out. Okay, now to the point, and we kind of talked about this last time, this idea of colonial unity, certainly before the French Indian War, as John Adams says it here, the 13 colonies were 13 different clocks uh, which had their own time. But slowly and surely over this period of about a decade, the colonies that were once very divided, once were very, very protective of their own autonomy as a colony, were all the willing now to start to give up that autonomy, but not to the British Empire, but instead to a newly formed United States uh, that is fighting for its independence from uh, the tyrannical British Empire. Um, and so that is really what we should be thinking in, in total as we're talking about these events that they are slowly but surely going to create colonial unity and an independence movement. Okay, But where is it all coming from again? Well, like we talked last time, it's the money. Okay. Now, last time we talked about the Stamp Act and Grenville's idea um, as, you know, to raise this money through this taxation on paper goods. Now, of course, the lesson that the British learned from that was not, hey, the colonists are basically going to reject any sort of taxation on them without representation. That was what the colonists hoped, them, hoped they would understand. Um, but... That is not what the British Parliament understood, and that is not what this guy, Charles Townsend, understood. Now, by this time, in 1767, uh, Townsend is serving as the Secretary of the Exchequer, which is basically the, the treasury um, in the British government system. Um, now, the, the British Parliament, the treasury, the king... Um, still had not moved off of this idea that revenue needed to be raised, particularly on the colonists, okay? What they did realize, though, is that perhaps this revenue needed to be raised in different ways. So what this Townshend Act did was set up import duties, okay? Now, what these import duties would be is basically taxes, okay? They're still taxes, but they're indirect taxes, okay? Because the person buying the product at the, at the end of the line, okay, so the end consumer, is not having a line on their bill for taxes, okay? Instead, these are going to be collected upon import or export, okay? Now, that means that the merchants would see the taxes, but then... It would go to the stores and the, the artisans and stuff who would sell it to 
individuals like you and me without a extra tax applied, but the money you're paying might be a little higher because guess what? The merchants are passing that tax burden down along down the chain, okay? Now, there are going to be a lot more things taxed under this Townshend plan. Uh, we see papers on there, uh, but things like glass, paint, and tea, okay? These are generally everyday items for the colonists, but they're generally things that the colonists cannot really make for themselves. Like glass manufacturing was very, very early on in the colonies, and so they certainly cannot make enough glass for all of the need of the 13 colonies. So those are things like glass that they're going to have to import from the mother country, okay? Now, this money was kind of earmarked for royal governors, colonial officials, okay? So again, it's paying for kind of the administration of these things over in the colonies. And in a way, because prior to this, most colonial governors and officials got paid through taxation by colonial assemblies, you're also sort of bringing in your royal governors and making sure they're going to be more loyal to the parliament than, say, those colonial assemblies. Now, this will just reignite the fight over taxation, okay? Now, even though it was an indirect tax, so it wasn't necessarily something that uh, the end consumers would see, you know, and be like, hey, this thing's more expensive because of taxes. At the same time, the colonists weren't really that stupid, okay? They knew what was up, all right? And we start to see colonial assemblies responding, like Massachusetts. They will condemn the new taxes, okay? They call for other colonial assemblies to join a protest, right? And then we start to see that in Boston, a non-importation boycott begins again, okay? And they're saying, listen, we're not going to import any of these goods whatsoever uh, or any other British goods to send that message that was so successful during the Stamp Act crisis just a couple years before. Now, unlike the Stamp Act, though, the response by the British is not to back down. Instead, it is to dig in, okay? And... Townshend will focus on Boston especially, even though there was generally widespread anger about this, Boston and Massachusetts generally was certainly kind of the hotbed of this rising ferment against British control. Now, starting in, in late 1768, uh, the first of a new detachment of royal troops landed in Boston, about 4,000 of them, all right? Now, these troops are coming in. They weren't the first Redcoats to be in that colony or the 13 colonies generally, but they are there pretty explicitly to try and keep the peace there because the colonists are getting more and more and more rowdy, okay? Now, this simmers for about a year until March 5th of 1770. Now, on that evening, a group of Bostonians... A uh, pretty rowdy group is out in front of uh, a British customs house. So this is like where the tax collectors have their offices, you know, where where all that tax collecting business is going through. Okay, now these hecklers they're they're jeering, screaming, you know, you know, saying really awful, nasty things about the the customs officials. Um, but not just that; they seem to be armed with clubs. They have rocks. It's March, so it's still wintertime in Boston. Uh, so there's uh, some snow on the ground. They're grabbing snowballs, putting oyster shells in the snowballs, um, which if you guys don't really know much about oysters or haven't had oysters, the shells are like basically like really sharp rocks. And so you get hit with one of those, you could get cut open, could be bleeding, a lot of different things. So they're rowdy. They're not a peaceful demonstration in any way, Okay. Now, out in front of the Customs House is a detachment of British Redcoats. Now, no one exactly knows how this next event went down, okay? Um, some say that perhaps a shot was fired, you know, from far away. Perhaps one of the Redcoats got hit and he accidentally fired. Or perhaps the Redcoats intentionally fired into the crowd, okay? But... What we do know is that the Red Coat Detachment opened fire into the crowd, and by the time the smoke cleared, five townspeople were on the ground dying. 
one of which Crispus Attucks, a uh, freed slave, uh, be, uh, a black man becoming one of the first victims of this American Revolution, which we know is coming, but at this time they didn't quite know. Now, this incident, the Boston Massacre, will be popularized very quickly. One way will be this right up here. So this is a woodcut. Uh, a woodcut was a way back in these days before Xeroxes and copies that um, the uh, folks that were like printing in newspapers could make multiple copies of an image, okay? Because back in these times, if you wanted a painting or, or kind of a drawing, you'd either have to draw it multiple times or you could do this woodcut, okay? Where you would actually make the image by carving it out of wood um, and then to make copies of it, you would paint the woodcut and put it down on paper and then take it up and then do it as many times until the ink ran out and then you would re-ink it and thereby you're basically making copies, okay? Now, uh, this, uh, this woodcut, the one that we're seeing right up here, was made by a guy you probably heard the name of, Paul Revere. Now, Paul Revere will become a little bit more important um, as part of the Midnight Ride, uh, where he said that, you know, the British are coming, the British are coming prior to the Battle of Weston Concord uh, five years later. Uh, but this is part of his uh, job as like an artist, woodcutter. He's also a silversmith. So this was created. And it was called the Boston Massacre in the newspapers. Now, by this time, there had been some organized resistance to British control particularly starting with the Stamp Act. And one of these groups that is very, very highly organized are the Sons of Liberty. There was also a sister organization, the Daughters of Liberty as well, that was connected. Um, now, the Sons of Liberty was formed by this guy, Sam Adams, okay? Uh, and you might recognize his name. He was a, uh, 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 back then was a brewer, one of his many jobs. And so today there is a, a popular uh, beer brand named after him, okay? Uh, but he also had other things he was involved in, and the thing he was most passionate about were, the, were this growing patriot cause uh, of resistance against the British, ultimately ending in the independence movement. Now, Sam Adams will, will organize the Sons of Liberty into a you know fierce force that begins roundly decrying this incident as the Boston Massacre, okay? Now, of course, the death of those five folks was absolutely regrettable, was awful, shouldn't have happened, but this terminology is not used unknowingly, okay? The compatriots know that it was five people that died and five people that were not necessarily the most peaceful people, but that doesn't matter because they're, they're trying to highlight is this... British barbarism, okay, that they're coming over and now they're killing loyal colonists, okay? And so that's where uh, Paul Revere's woodcut, the engraving, comes in because it shows these British soldiers as merciless brutes, okay? Now, in reality, it's a lot more unclear what went on. Um, in fact, uh, eventually charges will be leveled against uh, the captain and the troops that were involved, uh, the Redcoat troops that were involved, and ironically, in that case, the, the Redcoat captain and his men will be defended by Sam Adams' cousin, John Adams, who will make the argument so forcefully in court that it was just a mistake and that the colonists were not necessarily so peaceful uh, that the, the Redcoats are acquitted of all crimes related to this that they were charged by the colonial uh, government of Massachusetts. Uh, suffice it to say, this causes some problems between Sam and his cousin, John. Now, eventually, John Adams is going to get on board with independence. He's a delegate to the Constitutional, or the, uh, the, the Continental Conventions, Continental Congresses that talk about independence, and he himself eventually will become the second president of the United States, which we'll talk about later on down the road. But in the short term, something had happened literally on the same exact day as the Boston Massacre. Of course, no one in Boston could have known this that night, but that same exact day, 
the British Parliament had just passed a bill to repeal all the towns and duties, thereby getting rid of most of the problems of the colonists. And I say all of the towns and duties, yeah, except for one on T. Okay. Now, what we see, though, is that in the wake of the Boston Massacre, there are inflamed tensions, but with the getting rid of most of these duties, things kind of chill out for just a minute. Okay? Both sides, both the British Parliament and leadership and the colonial leaders kind of realize, wow, we've got to this pretty crazy point now. Okay? And so things kind of cool off from the Boston Massacre for a couple years. But what has been made clear, though, is that this crisis is not going to go away and that now there are these increasing feelings of distrust between British officials who think they're acting in the best interest of colonists by, by doing these taxes and stuff and a new, very youthful and more and more radical group of American leaders. Now, we'll fast forward a few more years. But we're going to stay in Boston because this is where the next flashpoint is. So things do chill out for a few minutes in, uh, in a few years in uh, Boston as well as in the rest of the colonies. But something happens in 1773 that changes that. Now prior to this event, the Boston Tea Party, the British have passed the Tea Act. Now the Tea Act was a bill passed through the British Parliament not necessarily trying to uh, punish or even raise the money from colonists, but instead had to do with the British East India Company, which was the, one of the largest importers of tea from, uh, from India and the Far East. And it was this bill, the Tea Act, was designed to help the East India Company because it was kind of failing. It was on its road to being completely shuttered. So the British Parliament had an idea to make it where in their colonies... The, most of the tea trade had to go through the East India Company. Okay? This was kind of intention to give them a monopoly, thereby to kind of strengthen their economic position so they could continue on as a going interest. But this angered colonists across the British Empire, but of course in the 13 colonies especially, where there were independent tea merchants that would no longer be able to do their business under this new tea act because they were not part of the East India Company. And again, we see one of the biggest areas of anger towards this is in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, in the late part of 1773, one of these uh, British East India Company ships comes into Boston Harbor full of tea for sale. Now, the uh, harbor workers... Uh, they refused to work on the ship to take the tea off and bring it into Boston Harbor. They refused to bring it onto land. So the boat just sits out in the harbor for, for several, several weeks just sitting there until December 16, 1773, when a group of Boston patriots, mostly the Sons of Liberty, led by Sam Adams yet again, dressed as Mohawk Indians, go out to Boston Harbor get on the, the boat, and throw about 342 chests of tea into the harbor. This would be worth uh, tens of thousands of pounds uh, in their money. Today, in our modern money, we're talking about millions of dollars worth of tea thrown into the harbor and unable to be used. Uh, in fact, even days after the event, Sons of Liberty uh, supporters were seen on the shores of Boston Harbor finding boxes of tea that had not been fully opened and broke open and breaking them open and throwing them back into the harbor so no one could use them, okay? Now, this event uh, was called the Boston Tea Party, okay? Um, and it set off a firestorm, okay? British authorities now not only have seen, you know, uh, the, the kind of... Uh, disobeying of their laws and kind of the, the outrage, but now actively destroying property, not owned directly by the British government, but kind of in the name of the British government, destroyed completely, okay? This would prompt the uh, British Parliament to pretty quickly pass the Coercive Acts, okay? To coerce is to try to, like, force someone to take action by putting bad, you know, uh, 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 consequences on them, 
And this is what the coercive acts would do. It would set a series of very, very strong actions against the government of Massachusetts and the people of Massachusetts. Like, they shut down Boston Harbor to all trade, so no trade coming in or out of Boston Harbor. They take away uh, the self-government in Massachusetts and dissolve their colonial assemblies. Um, they force the quartering of troops in uh, the homes and warehouses of the people of Boston if needed to uh, house a growing number of redcoats that are there to keep the peace. Okay, And they say that all of these uh, restrictions will remain on Massachusetts until the debt of what the tea was worth is repaid. This has really taken things to another level. Now, before I move on, I do want to address one of the enduring questions of the Boston Tea Party that I just kind of glossed over. Why were they dressed as Indians? Okay. The truth is, is that we don't absolutely have the correct answer to this. We don't know for sure. Um, there are different things that have been proposed by historians. Um, some have proposed that it was a manner of disguise, that these people did not want to be openly known by who they really were. Um, but at the same time, that one's been challenged because it was pretty clear right from the get-go who had taken this action. So that one doesn't really hold water. Um, other folks have, have argued, you know, based on some evidence that uh, it was perhaps a way of showing their true Americanism. Okay, that they were true Americans and not really these British subjects anymore, which is kind of ironic given that these folks are the descendants of English uh, settlers and in no way Native Americans. Uh, but it definitely happened this way. They definitely were dressed up that way, even if we're not 100% sure why they did that. Now back to these coercive acts. Now, in this class, we probably need to know both names, but most colonists didn't know this Act of Parliament as the Coercive Act. They knew it as the Intolerable Acts, because to them, they could not tolerate them. They could not abide by them, okay? And as I mentioned, it closes the Boston port, uh, cur curtails government, authorizes the army to quarter troops, among some other provisions, but those are the most important for us. Now, this sent a shockwave, not through just Massachusetts, but through the rest of the colonies, because it really did confirm what so many people had been afraid of for so long, which is that the British really were going to come and kind of put very strict control on them, and most especially take away their rights to self-government. Okay, Now, from the perspective of Parliament, it really wasn't that way. It was really intended to isolate Massachusetts and to really send an example that, you know, this could happen to you, but we don't want to do it. Just don't do crazy stuff like the Boston Tea Party. But that is not what happens. And instead, many of the other colonists start to come, and the other colonies and their leaders start to come to the point of, oh, crap, maybe this can happen to us. Maybe we should do something about it. Now, in September of 1774, a group of 55 representatives elected by the colonies and, uh, and the voters in those colonies will meet in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And they want to come up with a unified response to the Intolerable Acts, one that does something to protect those people in Massachusetts that are being treated so wrong as they see it. Now, the First Continental Congress does come out with a few decisions. One, they say, we're going to boycott again, and we're going to do a total boycott. Everything from British uh, uh, companies and uh, coming off British ships, we are boycotting. We will not take any of it. We're going to hit them where it hurts in their pocketbook. But secondly, another decision is to start to organize militias for defense, because as we see, more and more redcoats are showing up in the colonies every single day. But one thing they don't decide upon is talking about independence. And in fact, uh, they try to send some petitions, uh, like the uh, it's called the Olive Branch Petition, to the king to kind of talk about, listen, we have these problems. We want you to fix them, but we don't want to leave. We want to be part of the British Empire, but just please respect us to some extent. Respect our self-government, uh, and we will be loyal subjects yet again. Now, we see that that doesn't work. And in fact, when that olive branch position lands uh, on King George III's desk, 
he throws it right in the garbage. And the boycott, while effective in prior times, does not seem to be moving the British leadership in any way. And if anything, it's only stealing their reserve, uh, the resolve not to break and not to change course on the intolerable acts. Now, we move forward a little bit, and we get to May 1775. Now, that is when the Second Continental Congress will convene in Philadelphia. But they did have some changes in between. Most notably, just a few months earlier in Boston, uh, a British detachment led by General Thomas Gage was on the hunt for some of the Sons of Liberty, namely two guys, uh, Samuel Adams, who we talked about before, another guy, John Hancock, who was a well-known merchant in Boston. Uh, some folks would also call him a smuggler because he was breaking British... Uh, uh, mercantilist law to bring in stuff from other countries and stuff like that. Now, these uh, Sons of Liberty had organized into militias, and militias were popping up throughout towns, uh, uh, towns across Massachusetts. And Gage had heard that the Sons of Liberty and Adams and Hancock had gotten together a arsenal of weapons, a weapons cache that would be easily accessible by some of these patriot colonial militias. Now, Gage, he will go and send himself, uh, he and his men out to Lexington, uh, uh, or out to Concord, Massachusetts, where they think that this cache is. Uh, and word gets out that evening that he's going to be out there marching out there sometime before uh, the sun rises the next day. Now, uh, this is where Paul Revere comes in again with his midnight ride. He, along with several other riders, he wasn't the only one, would begin uh, riding horses and going as fast as they could to warn towns along the way to Concord that the British were coming, and they were coming by land, not by sea, and they were coming to come and get that, that weaponry. Now, Gage and his men would set out the next day, but due to Revere and the others' actions, uh, when they get to Lexington, a, a town about halfway between Boston and Concord, uh, there is a small Patriot militia there blocking the road and not letting them by. Now, no one really knows how it started, uh, but eventually someone fires shots. Okay. Some would say the British fired first, others say the Patriots fired first, others say it was a gunshot from a third party of far away, but regardless, shots were fired. And these shots became the shots heard round the world as uh, the first time a colony and a colonial subjects are standing up to with violence against the British Empire. Now at Lexington, the colonial militia is pretty well defeated and is forced to flee, but they had sort of bought time because as the Redcoats get back on the march, by the time they get to Concord, an even larger Patriot militia is waiting there for them. And this battle does not go so well for the, the, uh, for the British. The British uh, Redcoats, who are a professional army, they do kill more of the Patriot militia on the other side of the battle, but also the British Redcoats are forced to retreat back to Boston. So, we see that while this is not quite a victory for the colonists uh, and the folks from Massachusetts, it's also not quite a loss. And so, two months later, uh, when the, the Second Continental Congress meets, uh, it's pretty clear that this revolution has begun. Now, one of the outcomes uh, immediately is the formation of a Continental Army, uh, with a leader at its head, George Washington, who was a longtime colonial leader. He was part of the detachment of troops that went out into the Ohio River Valley and kind of got that French and Indian War started by confronting the French uh, and losing in a battle to the French out there. Um, and by this time, he was kind of seen as an elder statesman and probably the best colonial military leader that they possibly could find. However, in May of 1775, no decision on independence was made yet. Now, there were certainly delegates at the convention, like John Adams, who by this point was a full-on patriot and calling for independence, who were pushing for independence in a Declaration of Independence. But others, particularly the more conservative uh, uh, 
members of states from the South and places like uh, New York and Pennsylvania were really, really reticent to go and pull the trigger on this because they knew once you declared independence, you couldn't go back. So let's talk a little bit about how people started to think about being revolutionary, the revolutionary mindset. Now, as we mentioned at the start of this video, it's all about British action, colonial reaction, okay? Now, in the end, though, it does bring up important philosophical questions about what the British can and cannot do to their colonies, okay? Now, if you ask Parliament, these acts, the Stamp Act, the Townshend Act, the Tea Act, it was all about raising revenue, okay, to help pay for imperial expenses that in their eyes benefited the colonists, okay? But instead it raised the question at the base of, does Parliament have the right to tax the colonies? Because the colonies aren't represented in Parliament, okay? Now, those have to deal with taxation. So that goes back to the idea of taxation without representation, right? But there's also this change from this period of salutary neglect where the British generally ignored the colonists as long as money was being made to this period of parliamentary sovereignty where the parliament's taking direct control. And these other acts, like the Proclamation of 1763, the Quartering Act of 1765, and the, all the Intolerable Acts, they were more in that vein of parliament exerting force and trying to force the colonists to act in the way that they wished. Those didn't have to do with raising money. They had to do with asserting authority and control. But while they were intended by the uh, British Parliament to kind of break the rebellion, what they did was the exact opposite. They intensified the resistance, they intensified the rebellion, and they pushed the Americans towards Republican values, okay? Now, what are we talking about here? Republican values, okay? Well, a, the Republican view, and this is not Republican like our, the political party today, the Republican Party, but small r Republicanism. So this is kind of a, a government, a political idea that is at least in part why the Republican Party is called what they are today. Okay. Now, at its base, Republicanism is this idea that government should be based upon the consent of the governed. Okay? And if you're thinking back to the Enlightenment, you're thinking about the right thing. Okay? This idea of the consent of the governed, which John Locke had talked about, which Rousseau had talked about, um, a lot of these Enlightenment uh, thinkers had thought and talked about and written about, was this idea that the power of government does not come from the king and his divine right to rule that was true for as long as anyone ever knew at this point in history. Uh, no one really remembered back much, much further when ideas like the Roman Republic existed. They're kind of challenging that divine right of kings, saying, listen, the government exists because people consent to be governed. Okay? And they give up their rights, like John Locke would say, some of their rights to liberty and property in exchange for protection of basic rights like life. Okay, But you give it up on purpose in exchange for those things. And so the flip side is also true, that if you give those things up to be protected, that if those things, that those rights you're giving up and in, in, in exchange for protection of your essential liberties and freedoms, if those essential liberties and freedoms are being challenged or even harmed by the government, well, guess what? You and the people generally should have the power to take it back. Okay? And that doesn't work under the divine right of kings because if the king gets his power because God chose him to be king, what role do the people have in it at all? Now, of course, this idea of republicanism is to us, we're like, yeah, duh, right? That's why people vote and stuff, right? Yeah, if you're thinking about it that way, you're absolutely right. It doesn't make sense to us in the same way. But to this, the folks, this time, this was a revolutionary idea to believe in, okay? And so what we see is that as this resistance picks up and as the British continue to take actions and so on, the leaders in the colonies begin to view this Republican form of government 
as the preferred form of government, okay? Because the monarchy could just do whatever it wants, whenever it wants. But this republic government, well, you know what? It would be small. It would be limited in the right in the things that it could do and what it couldn't do, what rights it could and could not take from the people, and what things had to be protected for the people. Um, and then ultimately, it would be responsible to the people uh, and would have to respond to what the people wanted, its needs, its wants, because otherwise, that consent would be taken back. Now, we get to the beginning of 1776, a pretty important year in the American Revolution. Uh, January 1776, a recent, fairly recent uh, immigrant from Britain Thomas Paine releases a very brief pamphlet called Common Sense. Now, Paine, he had come to the Americas, kind of, he, he had heard about uh, the resistance going on as early as the 1760s. Uh, he had lived a long time in Britain, but not really had a lot of success in any of the careers he tried. So he came to America trying to make a life for himself and ended up kind of being hooked up with this patriotic movement. And he writes this pamphlet as a way to try to persuade particularly colonists who were kind of on the fence, who were like, listen, I don't like what the British are doing, but independence? You're crazy. What are you talking about? Okay. And he tries to make the argument that it's common sense to break away from the British Empire. Okay. And he talks about these ideas of Republican values that we just spoke about are, are common sense. And it's obvious it's what should be because this monarchical, monar monarchical system of government is a threat to the people's liberty whenever because the king can just decide he wants to take away freedoms and then what are you going to do? What can you do? He's the king, okay? And instead, Payne calls about King George III being a royal brute. We should scorn him and not venerate him, okay? Now, Payne is, 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 is reacting to a lot of kind of moderate colonists who are saying, listen, we need a compromise. We need to find a middle ground where the British kind of chill out, but that maybe we stop our resistance too. And Payne says no. And he uses the example of Massachusetts pretty clearly and says, listen, if it was your family being attacked by the British Redcoats, if they were burning your farm or attacking your kids or your wife, would you want to compromise with them? No, of course not. So why are you telling folks to compromise? Okay? And instead he said, you got to declare independence. It began the world over again. Now, this is Payne's probably biggest impact that he has in his entire life and kind of gets a lot of the colonists who are in the middle off the sidelines, and many of them start to become Patriot supporters. Now, of course, Payne, he would go on to be involved in the revolution uh, to a large extent. Eventually, he ends himself up in France, and he's there for the French Revolution, too. And he is such a part of that that he gets put in jail for a minute in France. Um, so, yeah, he, he does not get guillotined. So he, he, he escapes that. Uh, but uh, he got pretty close. Uh, pretty, pretty close. You know, uh, he was not in that much danger here in the colonies. I'll tell you that much. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of common sense. Okay, because common sense does share some connections with other really, really important periodicals and things that have come out, okay, uh, over the course of, of the decades and centuries of American history, okay? Common sense is a huge bestseller. It sells tons and tons of copies. You know, Payne makes a little bit of money off of it, you know, but he's doing it for the whole other reason, okay? And it's compelling. It is a compelling argument that actually does change a lot of people's minds, okay? Now, we're going to fast forward a few periods to the 1850s, so this would be something we're going to talk about in period five, but there's another book that comes out in the 1850s uh, written by a woman called Harriet Beecher Stowe who writes this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which also is an instant bestseller, and it is a uh, something that's very persuasive on the issue of slavery in the American South and a new fugitive slave law that had been placed on... Uh, on all of the uh, states of the Union at that time in order to try and keep control over slavery and keep the institution of slavery strong in the American South. But this book begins to raise more and more anger towards the Fugitive Slave Law, towards slavery as an institution, and helps uh, grow and persuade a lot of Northerners to begin to support 
abolition. So we see that, yet again, these, these periodicals, these books, they're connected because they both became super, super popular, and they were very, very integral at changing American opinions at a very, very important and pivotal point in time. Now, speaking of turning points, the Declaration of Independence is absolutely one of those. Okay? Now, by the summer of 1776, the Second Continental Congress is still in session. And by the summer of 76, many more Americans have become at least sympathetic, if not open, supporters of the Patriot Independence cause. So the moderates in the Second Con uh, Continental Congress are starting to realize, listen, we lost. The independence is coming. But one of the final things the, these folks really pushed for is that if we're going to do this, you know what? We need to write it down. We need to say why it's happening, okay? So there are no questions on either side why this movement is beginning, okay? Now, this Declaration of Independence uh, would be written primarily by this guy, Thomas Jefferson, okay? He's the primary writer of the Declaration of Independence. There are some other folks that are involved in it, uh, namely John Adams, Ben Franklin are involved in kind of editing it uh, amongst others, uh, but Jefferson's the main writer, and so if you call him the writer of the Declaration of Independence, you wouldn't be wrong to say that. Now, Jefferson uh, was chosen because while he was kind of a, a soft-spoken kind of dude, he was known as a very good writer and someone who could very, very clearly articulate his thoughts. But he didn't come up with this stuff out of nowhere. Instead, he went back to somebody we spoke about uh, in uh, period two, went back to John Locke. Okay, and particularly John Locke's idea of natural rights. Okay, okay, that these natural rights um, were, you know, life, liberty, and property. In Locke's view, uh, of course, Jefferson would change that to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not uh, ensuring a right to property for all of the colonists and soon to be Americans. Okay, but. Other ideas, like this idea that government's power comes from the consent of the governed, which is something Locke and other Enlightenment thought, uh, leaders and writers talked about, um, and that these natural rights are unalienable, okay? And by that means that they, they belong to you because they're natural. They're given to you by God or by nature, these rights of life, liberty, and property, and that government cannot take them away from you no matter what. They can try but they can't do it, okay? Now, again, these ideas are fundamental to kind of the ideas of, of Americanism and the Republic today, but at this time, they truly are revolutionary because no one has said that, you know, the people are afforded rights and that God gives them rights and that they're not rights given to you by the king who is truly appointed by God and all that stuff. No, it's completely new. It's completely crazy for someone to be writing this down and putting it in this document, okay? Now, we do see that there are some bigger questions, though, at hand, even going beyond uh, this idea of, of independence in period three, okay? Because there's some other phrases in there that have been enduring parts of the American story, okay? Um, for one, it's not about the rights of Englishmen. Okay? It's not about the rights of, of the wealthy landowners. Okay, It's about natural rights that belong to everybody. Okay, These universal principles derive from the laws of nature and nature's God. Okay, And of course, in it, Jefferson does say that all men are created equal, which is something that we hold very, very strongly as part of the American dream. Okay? Now, of course, one of the grand ironies of Jefferson writing this is that Jefferson, at that moment writing that, was a slave owner. He owned slaves, okay? So how could this white landowning slaveholder say, hey, all men are created equal, okay? Well, of course, to him at that time when he wrote that, he wasn't thinking about the slaves that he owned. He wasn't thinking about the millions of slaves across the American South, no. But it doesn't really matter what he was thinking, because the words stand by themselves, okay? And so while they are in contradiction here, these ideas of all men are created equal, 
okay? Uh, which is not truly seen in the Declaration of Independence, because if it was, they would have said, we're going to abolish slavery completely, and it doesn't do that. But that all, phrase, all men create equal, it doesn't go away, and it continues to impact us today and the ideas that we're constantly trying to make it where all men and women today are truly equal, even though sometimes we're doing well at that and sometimes not so much. Now let's talk a little bit about the war. And when I say let's talk a little bit, let's just talk a little bit, okay? Because much like the French and Indian War, the College Board does not really super duper focus on the battles, okay? Now, we may do some activities that tie these in, but really what I want you to understand are the big outcomes. Why America won and why Britain lost, okay? Now, America had not the biggest advantages going into this war, okay? Um, the reality is, is that if you look at the money, okay, the British have way more money. If you look at the fighting uh, uh, ability of the troops, the British Redcoats were a professional, well-drilled army, no fighting force like them really in the Americas, okay? If you look at the size of the Redcoat army, it was way bigger than the, the Patriot forces, Okay. Uh, the British Navy was the strongest Navy in the world. All these things are clear disadvantages to the Americans, okay? But we overcome them. How? Well, one is that the British commanders continually underestimated the American soldiers. Now, don't get me wrong. They were ragtag, okay? Uh, they were made up of, yes, the Continental Army led by Washington, but also just series of militias spread out across the colonies, and then just regular civilians and citizens who were just there and at times stepped up into fight because fighting was happening in their area, okay? And even with that, the Patriots are able to win. Now, one of the, the things that is kind of lost about Washington and as him as like this military hero is that usually when we think about our military heroes, we think about fighters and people who are fighting and fighting and fighting. That wasn't really Washington's legacy of the Revolution. In fact, in a lot of, especially the early battles that the Continental Army fought, they lost. They would lose, you know, maybe with some small victories. But overall, most of the war was spent with the Continental Army fighting and then retreating from the British Redcoat armies that were pursuing them. But the thing is, is that even through tough times, like in uh, Valley Forge, uh, in the winter of 1777 to 78, um, the Continental Army is able to stay together. It's able to stay formed, and it's able to continue to fight as a fighting force, which for the British was bad because they couldn't win the war unless the Continental Army was defeated, and they never completely defeated them, and Washington and his men never surrendered. Okay, They always got away. And even in the face of poor resources, the colonists and the Patriot fighters are resilient. Okay. Now, back over in Britain, the British government completely confused, completely inept. It's totally divided. Okay, like The king is very, very strong to fight this war. He's really the last one to kind of accept that independence is a foregone conclusion. But within the British government, there are differences of opinions. And a lot of folks like uh, William Pitt would argue, listen, we, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why are we doing this to them? Okay, this would be William Pitt the Elder, if you know there are two William Pitts. Okay? There's no unity by the British government to fight in this war and do what it takes to win it. And so they don't. Okay? Now, eventually, after the Battle of Saratoga uh, in 1777, the French will come on board as part of an alliance with the Americans. Now, this is really on the French side of things, uh, coming out of two things. One, after the Battle of Saratoga, where the Americans rout a British force marching down from Canada in upstate New York, it becomes pretty clear that the Americans are actually not as ragtag as they look, and they might be able to stand a chance against the British. But clearly, they need some help to win, particularly the help of the British or the French Navy to help neutralize that naval advantage. Now, the French are also trying to get some payback from their big loss in the French and Indian War, so they provide a ton of military help, diplomatic support, and financial help. And they actually put a lot of money into the American War of Independence, which kind of comes back and bites them in the butt because they get a lot of debt, 
And then when they try to raise taxes to pay that debt, uh, they kind of have like a whole revolution happen over there. Um, but that's not really the focus of our class, but yeah, it did happen. Okay. Now, one of the last reasons the Americans won is because of what they were fighting for. The British soldiers fighting were there because that was their job. They're getting paid to do it. Okay. And they're fighting in this far flung area in the British colonies. Okay. So they're there because they're getting paid. The American troops are fighting because they believed in something. They believed in these Republican ideals, okay? At the very least, they believed in defending their land and their families, okay? And it wasn't that they were powerful. It wasn't that they were the most powerful country in the world, because they absolutely weren't. It was because they were dedicated to these ideas. Now, the treaty that ends the war, the American uh, War of Independence, the Revolutionary War, is called the Treaty of Paris of 1783. So, as I mentioned in the last video, don't get it confused with the Treaty of Paris 1763 because while they happen in the same place and involve some of the same players, this is the war, uh, the, the treaty that ends the War of Independence, okay? Because you know that it happens in 1783 after the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now, what are the outcomes of this war? Okay, well, the treaty would recognize American independence and their sovereignty of not only the area of the 13 colonies, but for all the lands to the Mississippi River, okay? Now, the northern boundary would be the Great Lakes, what is now more or less the, the modern-day boundary with uh, Canada. And then Florida, which for a time was under British control, will be reverted to Spanish control. Um, and Florida, yet again, would go back to the Spanish for a little bit of time, and then we'll get it back a few decades later. Now... America made some promises to compensate loyalists who had to flee because uh, a lot of loyalists lost their land by confiscations by the colonial and the state governments. Okay? Um, but out of this, independence has been achieved. That's pretty crazy. Can't believe it happened, but it did. Now, next time we'll get into this topic. So we have a, a, a independence. Now what? Good question. But we'll save that for next time. See you then. Bye!